Brethren, good evening. Pastor is on his way here, but before he comes, he has asked that we sing some hymns. So, this is the new selection. So, uh, Brethren, at the back. Firstly, could you turn to our hymnal 205, Thine is a Glory. This is a hymn that we typically will sing only during Easter, and for the rest of the year, this hymn is hardly sung. So I thought tonight we should begin with this rejoicing, joyous hymn. Thine is a glory risen conquering sun, endless is the victory thou, O death, hast won. May you all arise and let's sing joyfully with great assurance. So look to the Lord in prayer. Lord God Almighty, oh, what a blessed hymn that we have before us, that as we sung with great rejoicing in our hearts, as we meditate on all these wonderful verses penned by the servants of old, as we pen this beautiful hymn. A hymn that reminds us that indeed we worship not a dead God, not one that is corrupted and under the grave. But the Lord, we raise, we praise and we bless a risen Savior, a Savior that conquers all upon whom we who believed in him have the same glorious hope that we shall also 
be risen according to your sovereign will. We thank you, O Lord, for reminding us that in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will have this wonderful experience to be risen at thy coming. We thank you, O Lord, for all who are gathered here that at a close of the Lord's day, we will be found with a hymn on our lips, a joy in our hearts, and great expectation that thou would once again speak to us. We pray, O Lord, that you will again speak to us through thy servant, our pastor. We thank you for the blessedness of being able to hold the word of God in our hands, to be reminded not only through the direct commandments and teachings, but also from the lives of godly saints of old, as well as to be mindful to heed the sad circumstances and dire consequences of the wicked and the sinful. So Lord, open our eyes and do a wonderful, blessed work among our midst this evening. We thank you and we ask all this with thanksgiving in our Lord Jesus' most blessed and holy name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We'll sing another hymn, hymn 35, a hymn that reminds us all of the reality in life that the sin before us in our life are ever-changing. May the lyrics of these words once again enthuse us, motivate us in our everyday walk for the Lord's glory through all the changing scenes of life, in trouble and in joy, the praises of my God shall still my heart and tongue employ. 35.
I shall now ask Pastor to take over the pulpit. Let us prepare our hearts to listen to God's word. Pastor. Good evening, brethren. Glad to see you all in the Lord's house this evening. Every opportunity that God extends to us is to be taken with much thanksgiving. For these are opportunities that we have to hear God's voice uh, as it is recorded for us for our learning. Um, we have been looking into King Saul's life. King Saul, unfortunately, become prey to his own wrath, his own anger, uncontrolled anger. His anger was against a man whom God has chosen. God has chosen David to replace King Saul because Saul has become disobedient to God. He took things in his own hand. He was unwilling to wait for the prophet of God, Samuel, to offer sacrifices. And he was also unwilling to take heed to clear guidelines given by God. Such as when he attacked the Amalekites, the Lord told him to destroy everything that the Amalekites had and not to leave anything alive. But he brought back all the fattened animals for his own benefit and then he pretended it was brought back to offer sacrifices to God. And so the answer given to him was it is better to Obey than to sacrifice. Religious ceremonies have no value when our hearts have no regard for God and His Word. And we defy Him and we forsake His words. Whatever we offer in the form of worship, it becomes an abomination to God and it, it brings God's displeasure and wrath to, upon us. So we... So Saul becoming more and more alienated from God and God's servants. His disobedience to God not only pushed him away from God, but also from Prophet Samuel and David. So he found himself away from the love of God and the purposes of God. See, dear friends, this is something that we need to know. When we start, keep, when we start justifying our disobedience and entertain some form of bitterness toward others, it can be a very bad sign of our own departure from God and possibly great spiritual disasters awaiting us. King Saul's story is a tragic one. We have seen his anger causing him to act rashly without proper, just, uh, proper or just judgment of events. He has no sense of gratitude to a David who had been a great help to him both at home and in the battlefield. When King Saul was Disturbed by the demon, demonic afflictions, David was there to help him to play the music, to play the harp, and to soothe in King Saul's tormenting spirit. But King Saul had no compassion toward David. And when Philistines came against Saul, not once, but repeatedly. David was a man who took up the challenge. 
He put his life at risk when he went against the giant Goliath. Again, King Saul seemed to have forgotten all this. But in King Saul's house, there was a man, King Saul's son, Jonathan, who was very aware of David's godliness, loyalty to the king, and readiness to sacrifice his life to serve the king and God and the people. Jonathan loved David. Jonathan's love for David and David's love for Jonathan is legendary in the scriptures. The Bible actually says their mutual love was better than a woman's love for a man. In other words, they were sincere. Just the other day, one young person who knows this story told me, of course, you might know there are people who twist the story of Jonathan's affection for, his, uh, for David as homosexual love. There is no evidence whatsoever to show that. And what this young man who was talking to me said, you know, Pastor, recently I heard a pr preacher saying that uh, David had failed marriages all through. He had several wives, but none of them was sincerely loving him, and that's why he became so close to Jonathan. I said the whole thing is a, is a false interpretation of the scripture. At this point of time, uh, David had only one wife, Michal. He has not married the rest. So the relationship between Jonathan and, and um, David was not a sign of David's failed marriage. Of course, Michal was a calculative woman. We can see that. Michal, you know, was also King Saul's daughter. But she did love David to a certain extent that she uh, worked, I mean, she did what she could do to save David from the plot of her father. She forewarned David and David was able to escape uh, before uh, Saul's men came into the room to kill him. So what we see here in our story for today's study taken from 1 Samuel chapter 20. Turn your Bibles there, please. 1 Samuel chapter 20. <clears throat> And we shall look from verse 24 to 34. I'm not reading the passage ahead. I will take you through that passage as we move forward. 1 Samuel chapter 20. And we will consider verse 24 to 34. At this point of time, David went hiding. Jonathan knew that David is hiding because Saul was very determined to kill David. However, Saul was expecting David to appear again in his palace because David was returning to King Saul even though uh, Saul's attempt to kill David uh, happened on several occasions. It's twice we know he threw his javelin to kill David, but David escaped. So he thought David would come back again, but David was hiding. And so in verse 24, we read at the beginning that David hid himself in the field. So he decided to choose a hiding place in the fields, and he hid himself. And uh, Saul was expecting David to come back because there was a festive season, new moon festivity was uh, taking place, so we read at the sec in the second half of verse 24, when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to eat meat. So what happens is that it's a feast day. The king came to his meal table and he sat down. And of course, normally when the king sits on such a day of festivity, he would expect prominent men, to, men of his kingdom to come to him and have the meal with him. And so 
we actually read in the following verse, verse 25, and the king sat upon his seat, as at other times, even upon as uh, even upon a seat by the wall, and Jonathan arose, Abner sat by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. So it's very interesting. It was a time when the king expect uh, Jonathan, his son, Abner, the captain of his army, and David, one of his most valiant soldiers to be around. And the table had four chairs, one for King Saul, of course King, Saul is, King Saul's throne will be special, and the three other chairs, Jonathan, Abner, and David. But David's chair was vacant. And also we notice in verse 25, it is said that the king sat upon his seat, even upon a seat by the wall. By the wall. Now it's indicative that he was seated at a very prominent place. Maybe uh, everyone was looking toward him. He was at the end of the room where the wall is. But it is also very strategic strategically placed because behind you if it's a wall nobody can attack you from the back you are in a safer place you know your enemy coming from the front and probably even from the side and that's the advantage of sitting closer to the uh, to the wall and so it was very carefully chosen place he protected himself from any danger however he kept all the three men in view that if he wants to attack, he can attack them easily. And if, he, if they ever arise against him, he can also defend himself. So he carefully chose his place, which, which is nothing wrong. We expect prominent people to have prominent places. And the most uh, highest officer, the president or king, to be given the most, safest place in any location, and that should be the way. So he was there safe and sound in his palace, waiting for his closest allies to come and have a good meal. But as we noticed in verse 25, David's place was empty. At first, Saul Notice the absence of David, but said nothing. Please look at the next verse, verse 26. Saul spake not anything that day, for he thought something had befallen him. He is not clean, surely he is not clean. Saul noted the absence of David, and he reasoned in his own mind that something had befallen him. In other words, Saul said, David's absence could be an unplanned one. Something must have suddenly happened that prevented his coming. It's interesting in verse 26. Saul was kind in his thinking about David. Normally, when a man is full of anger, there's a tendency to be suspicious. Why is not David here? Maybe he can say, David must be plotting against me. Where is he? But that's not how uh, King Saul responded here. Here King Saul responds with uh, much, um, a much gentleness, a lot of uh, sympathy toward David, so he did not say anything against David that day, and he reasoned within himself, maybe something happened to him. And because he know David was such a valiant man, a strong and very able person, he didn't think he got into some accident or some enemy has come against David. He actually said, this is very interesting. Look at the end of verse 26. Saul says he is not clean. Surely he is not clean. 
Because on a feast day, when people come together, they are expected by the Levitical laws that they ought to be clean, ceremonially clean. So because it's a religious event and a feast day of the Jews, King Saul said, I know David well enough. He's a godly man. He's a man who respects God's word. And the only reason he could be abs absent today is because he may be ceremonially unclean. And he said it not once, but twice in verse 26. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. So that speaks of Saul's high esteem for David as a godly man. When I said high esteem, I'm not saying Saul really gave respect to David, but at least he knew the spiritual mindset of David. And he acknowledges it here. So maybe he was ceremonially unclean. There are various reasons uh, or various um, uh, means of uncleanness that the Bible spoke about uh, in the book of Leviticus. I'm not uh, going to read all of them. I've given you some references in your notes. Leviticus chapter 7, verses 20 to 21, chapter 11, verse 24, verse 38, chapter 13, verse 11, and so on. All of those passages tell you there are various uh, things that can make a person impure uh, uh, from coming to partake in the feast. Some of it can be like touching a dead body or coming in contact with a person who is infected with sickness like leprosy, which is seen as unclean, or that the person uh, has uh, committed an unclean act or, you know, uh, touch something unclean, an animal, or eat something unclean. So all these are mentioned in those stipulations in Leviticus. So Saul's action was a reflection of his positive thinking about David. So he said, well, he respects God and his word, and maybe he kept away because of that reason. However, things start to change. On the second day of the feast, David's seat remained vacant. Saul then investigated the reason for David's absence. Look at verse 27. It says, and it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet, neither as today nor today? Now if you carefully analyze this verse, you will see his mood is changing. King Saul is changing in his mood. Take a look at verse 27 again. Saul directs his question to Jonathan, his son. Wherefore cometh not, who? The son of Jesse to meet. The son of Jesse. David is Saul's son-in-law. His daughter Michal was given to David. Instead of Saying David, he referred to David as son of Jesse, which is correct. David's father is Jesse. But why must he say that he is son of Jesse at this point of time? To put a distance between him and David. He is not of me. He has no part with me. He is of another family. And of course, Jesse is a shepherd. And so this David is not worthy to be here. I believe this marks David's, uh, sorry, King Saul's disgust for David or disgust or hatred for David. Because this is not the first time he uses this 
this uh, designation or this manner of referring to David when he's angry. I, I also gave you some references where King Saul will refer to him as son of Jesse. It was not a very pleasant atmosphere in which uh, he says such a thing about David. Though it is an accurate description of David, yet it shows Saul's deliberate attempt to put a distance between him and David. It's an expression of his ill feeling. <laughs> I know of certain Christian lady who addresses her husband as darling and dear and honey and so on. But when she's angry, she will call him by his surname. So let's say if his name is Lim, he will say, Mr. Lim. She will say, Mr. Lim. That means she's angry already. You're not my surname. I'm not Mrs. Lim. You know, when you, when you hear the wife calling the husband, Mr. Lim, she forgets that she is Mrs. Lim. That's how I feel. But anyway, in that particular lady's case, I know there's something very weird. Why should we do that? Because we, people do that when they are unhappy. Maybe a little bit of soul spirit. We shouldn't be doing it. It's still your beloved, still your husband, still your wife, still your children. You shouldn't be giving them names. You will see later how he reacts to Jonathan. Oh. We feel like putting our fingers in our ears. You're going to come there soon. So this is the first expression of his bitterness in this incident where he started to show his dislike for David. And because Saul asked Jonathan about David's whereabouts at this point of time, Jonathan presented a story. It was not a precise story. It was a cover-up story. And Jonathan knew if Jonathan were to say, David is hiding in, that, in a field, he would then ask, tell me, where exactly is he hiding? Then he would send his people to kill, as he did in the past. So David come up with a, sorry, Jonathan come up with a story about David's absence. Verses 28 and 29. Let's take a look at that. Verses 28 and 29. Jonathan answered, So David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, Let me go, I pray thee. For our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother, he hath commanded me to be there. <laughs> Jonathan knows how to tell stories. He make it look very urgent that David must leave because David was commanded to be there. And so he went. And now, if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away. And so Jonathan said, David requested this, that Jonathan would give him permission to leave. And he said, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brethren. Then Jonathan says, therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. So it was something like Jonathan says that if you want to know why David is not there, it's because I gave permission to David to leave as there was an urgent situation that he had to go back home to be with his family to offer sacrifice to God. So he said, well, it's a very important matter. It's a spiritual matter. It's a matter of giving sacrifice. So he went to his own city and because his family, especially his brother, commanded him to go there, and so he left. Interesting story. Well, somebody might ask me, is it right for Jonathan to tell a lie? Of course not. Whoever tells a lie, it's not right. Whether it's Jonathan or David or Abraham or Jacob, it doesn't matter. A lie is a lie, and there are consequences to it. However, God is always gracious. You know, there is a situation where we see Rahab 
telling a lie about the spies while she was hiding them in her own house. She said to the soldiers of, uh, to, of Jericho that they went away and pointed them to a wrong direction while they, the spies were still with her in the house. And of course, we know, in a way, Rahab wanted to protect these men because she believed in the Lord of Israel. And she believed that God will destroy Jericho. And so she even pleaded with these spies to remember her when they have victory. So is it that God allow us to show our faith by lying? Some people ask. We know that Rahab was justified because of her faith. And so some people ask this question, was she justified because of her lie? Of course not. Now you know Rahab was a Gentile woman. She had no knowledge of Ten Commandments. She was an idol worshiper. Remember, she was a prostitute. What can you expect from a prostitute? But deception and lies and all kinds of shameful mannerism. And she did what she is familiar with. Of course, I'm sure she would repent of all her sin, including the lie she said. But in God's sovereign plan, some of our mistakes Though they are mistakes and not honoring God, yet God in mercy would allow these things to happen and yet save his people, not because of their mistake, but because of his mercy. Jonathan, in his desperation out of fear, told lies. A lot of people tell lies because they are afraid of the consequence if they tell the truth. It's not a good thing to do. It's not the right thing to do. And we must be prepared to face the consequences for telling the truth. However, like all, most men, Jonathan also lied to protect David. Now, Saul believed in Jonathan's story about David. Now, see what happens when Saul heard that Jonathan let David go. His anger fled against Jonathan. Immediately he became angry. Jonathan was in danger. And we read in the next two verses, verses 30 and 31. Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan and he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman. Do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established nor thy kingdom. <laughs> Very horrible words. He is cursing and swearing against his own son, Jonathan, and Jonathan's mom, which is his wife. He has no shame in saying these things. He has no sense that he is actually speaking evil of him, his own family. Instead of being a patient Husband and patient father, he chose to be a vulgar person at this time. In fact, his words were so framed to put a lot of sense of shame and guilt on Jonathan for allowing David to go. I notice four accusations that he makes in these words that we just read in verse 30 and first part of verse 31. Firstly, Saul accused Jonathan as a perverse person, a very wicked person. He said, thou son of perverse, rebellious woman, meaning you and your mother are all the same, perverse. 
a man who is corrupt in his mind, a man who is perverted, one who perverts justice, one who has no sense of fairness, a perverse person. I think Jonathan felt so bad, isn't it? He, the father not only is called him perverse, but even join him with his mum and says, you, you're as perverse as your mother, a rebellious woman. And then the second thing Saul accused Jonathan is that he's a betrayer because he said, thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion. Remember a while ago I told you that when Saul mentioned David as son of Jesse, it was a first sign of his animosity in that instance. There you can see that here. Thou hast chosen the son of Jesse. You are not choosing Saul. You are choosing Jesse and his son. You are confused. You don't know where your loyalty must be. You must be loyal to your father, which is me. But you chose to throw your loyalty to that shepherd boy, David. Ooh, he accused him of betrayal. He also accused him as a shameful son. The next phrase is the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. I don't want to think too much about those language. Perverse language. Coarse language. Terrible. Not, not at all worthy to think twice what it means. So let me go to the last of his accusation. A greedy, accursed son. <laughs> because he says, Thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. In fact, in verse 31, he said, As long as David lives in the, on this earth, you will never be established, nor thy kingdom. It sounds like Jonathan was after the kingdom of Israel. Which was never the truth. It was a false accusation. Jonathan had no desire to take over the throne. Not, uh, he had no desire, not because he is not an enterprising young man. We know he's a very uh, dedicated young man. He fought for Israel. He went against the Philistines once when King Saul was hesitating. And he achieved great victory. But the reason why Jonathan did not want to stand up and fight for the kingdom, uh, or rather the scepter and the throne, was because he knew that God has chosen David. It is his loyalty to God that he has manifested in his quietness and you know, desire to let it be in the hands of David. But somehow, the anger and bitterness in King Saul's mind caused him to twist the story and said, ah, no wonder you actually want this kingdom for yourself, but I'm telling you, as long as David lives, you will never have it. But this is not true. Four accusations. Why would he say all these things to, King, uh, to Jonathan? Why would Saul, as a father, say such things to his own son? Of course, the easiest answer is he's angry toward David, whom Jonathan has helped. The other reason is, is to get Jonathan somehow come over to his side. To stop him attempting any more uh, rescue operations for David. Sometimes we have this kind of attitude. We, we speak so evil about persons, hoping that the person will stop and turn. And the, you know, the, the danger of this kind of method, you can never see that you are wrong. You only think that a person is wrong. The more wicked things you can somehow cook up and throw at that person, you feel very justified and you feel your righteous father or righteous mother or righteous brother or righteous sister because you have so much to say. You have nothing. There's nothing in you that would stop you and say, is there something I'm thinking wrongly? 
Am I being so angry and screaming out what I feel? Maybe somewhere I'm wrong. A raging heart like King Saul is undiscerning of his own evil. He is so blinded, firstly to his own sin, that he cannot see the goodness, the innocence of the other, both of David and of Jonathan. It's a very serious situation. That's what anger and bitterness and hatred causes us to be, blind of our own sin. Worse still, make others wicked characters, even though they are clean and righteous. We need to be very careful about this, all of us. So Saul suddenly decided to get his son to his side and he made a royal command. He issued a royal command in verse 31. The second half of that verse we read, Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. It's a test of Jonathan's loyalty. If you are my son, if you are different from all that I said to you just now, then show it to me. Go get David here. By hook or crook, you get him here because I want him to be dead. A desperate attempt to get people on his side. You know, there are people who do this within families, within church, within governments, within offices. They want to establish themselves. And when they are unhappy with somebody else who is making progress, they start a campaign to get the rest on their side. Rumors, false accusations, slander. Somehow I must get the support of the people. It's very dangerous. Don't ever be like King Saul. You must know your defense is God not number of people. You better examine yourself whether your mind is thinking right, whether you are trying to show that you are great, you know, great in arguments, in reasoning, and you can twist and turn. Come on, slow down. Slow down. Don't be bitter. However, Jonathan wanted to think it right. He is still willing and ready to defend David and resist his father. Jonathan resisted his father's command and defended David. Look at verse 32. Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? A sense of justice. A desire to let the father think correctly and do correctly. Please, dad, don't say th things like this. Don't say evil about David. Jonathan never said a word against his father when the father derided him. Jonathan never defended himself. Jonathan is defending who? David. He said, his attitude is like this. Father, if you want to malign me, go ahead. Anyway, I don't have any plan to be a king. But David is God's chosen one. He must be on the throne. And it's my duty to speak a word for God's chosen servant. He was not busy defending himself. He was busy defending God's servant. Oh, you must learn this greatly. When God appoints godly men in places, it's our duty to be their defender. You know, I have said this loud and clear to our elders, to our preachers and our deacons, or maybe not so much of deacons, but elders and preachers and even staff of the church. 
and now let the deacons hear too. I'm not here to make use of you, or I'm not here to, you know, uh, beat you down if I feel that you are not helping me. My greatest duty is to defend you, because you said you are called by God. And not to defend you when you are wrong, but to defend you and help you when you are serving God. And I know if I ever move my smallest finger or even the nail of my smallest finger against you because you are called from, by God to serve him, God will deal with me. And I fear God and therefore I respect all of you around me. That's my duty. In the past, when I think about some of our fellow workers who left me and the church, I went way far out to meet them. I would meet them alone, sometimes in the middle of the night, way past middle of night. I'm super tired handling all the problems, and yet I would say, please come, let's talk for a while. Don't make rash decisions. Don't speak without thinking. And let some of them walk away with such disgust and disregard. What can I say? I feel very heartbroken even when I see some of them who walked away. But one thing I know by the grace of God, I have not dealt with any one of them unjustly. They might say I have been unjust, but that's a different thing. But I have made sure I have not acted against them. I didn't cast them out. They walked away. And I say that to all of you. If the Lord has called you, there's a need for us to be mutually respectful. Pastor must respect his fellow preachers. The pastor must respect the elders. And the deacons, and all the members for that matter. You are God's children. You are bought with the price that no one can pay, even the blood of Jesus Christ. How could I demean you or disregard you? God forbid. Even if I rebuke any of you, it must be out of love. To win your soul. To correct and instruct and strengthen you. Jonathan had that attitude. What a, what a fine man. Of course, he was not perfect. We saw in fear he lied to protect David. There was no need to do that. By doing it, he got himself in trouble. His father is now angry with him. But in the commotion of all these things, Jonathan still shows his desire for fairness. He said, Father, don't do this. Why would you have David slain? What hath he done? I want you to read Exodus 23, verse 7, please. Exodus chapter 23, verse 7. God had this very clearly stated in the scriptures, how we deal with others. Verse 7 of Exodus 23, keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and, the, and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. The Lord says, if you know a thing is not correct, you keep away from it, and never be part of the slaying of an innocent and righteous man. And that's what Jonathan was trying to do. The reason why he spoke up is not for his own defense, but for the defense of the innocent and the righteous, namely David. That was the right thing to do. He was a godly man. He wanted to hold up God's word in defending David. But Saul had no patience to listen to matters of justice and morality because he was filled with anger. He must see to the fact that his anger is avenged. If I can see David suffering and die, then I will feel some peace. Oof. Ferocious, ferocious anger. Be very careful when you start talking evil about others and 
and your heart rejoices to see the sad outcome of others who have given you some, some pain or you think they are your enemy. Never rejoice in the sufferings of your enemy. That is not divine. That's not spiritually minded attitude. When Jonathan spoke for David, that Saul should deal with him mercifully, not as an enemy. Listen to verse 33. Saul cast a javelin at him. At who? At Jonathan. To smite him. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. You see, again, Jonathan is thinking for David. De Jonathan sees his father's murderous attempt on his life as a hatred for David. The father still had feelings for Jonathan, but he was blinded by his hatred for David. He was so angry toward David, and he saw Jonathan aligning himself with David, he just wanted to kill Jonathan. Not because he was angry toward Jonathan, but because he's angry toward David. You know, you sometimes get your own children killed when you are angry for the wrong reasons and for, at wrong people. Meaning to say, if you are angry toward a just person, you may accidentally kill your own kids in that anger. Sometimes you quarrel with people, you're angry, and suddenly your child runs in because you're angrily behaving you may push the child who came saying, Daddy, Daddy, or Mommy, Mommy. The child may fall and die. Anger is very dangerous. At this point of time, you also notice something so startling. Someone else becomes angry. Who is that? Verse 34, Jonathan. We read... In verse 34, so Jonathan arose from the table in what? Fierce anger. What a situation. It's a time of festivity, it's a time of love and peace and unity. House divided, anger at its worst expression. Murder is filling the room only by the providence of God, Jonathan escapes. And at the entire situation is filled with unbelievable, humiliating, murderous anger of the father. This was done because Jonathan felt that his father was treating David shamefully, unrighteously. What a shame that my dad would behave like this. And so Jonathan was very angry in his heart. He was grieved. Well, on one hand, it shows the frustration of Jonathan. On the other hand, it shows a very pure display of Loyalty between two friends, a genuine loyalty. Even if Jonathan were to be killed, he would take it for David because he knew David was God's servant. I don't know whether you read today's junior worship article. Uh, I have a devotion shared <clears throat> in the junior worshippers page. Let me get there very quickly. It's taken from Ephesians 3.13, where Paul says to the Ephesian church, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. He says to Ephesians, you know, when you look at my troubles, because Paul wrote it from the prison in Rome, when you see my 
my sufferings, how people hate me and how people ill-treat me. I hope that you will not faint in your heart. When people hate me and people throw me in the prison, I hope you don't think that I'm an unworthy man. You know why this is an important counsel to the church? Because the servants of God who serve among the people of God are often the object of hatred of evil men, both within and without the church. And when they are hated and targeted by wrong, wrongly motivated people, the church can be very discouraged. And they may pull away from the church, from the man whom God put there to care for them and to teach them and nourish them. It's a very dangerous thing. It is so important for us to have a mind to recognize who is right and who is wrong. There are some Christians who say, I don't care, it's all politics. It's sometimes not politics. People make it look like politics. It's not always politics. When the Romans and the Jews came against Jesus, was it politics? No, it was a spiritual confrontation. We know what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane will do well to remember what happened in Gethsemane. Not here, the first Gethsemane. What happened? <laughs> Listen to this. In Matthew 26, 56, we read, All the disciples forsook him and fled. What happened? All the disciples, one betrayed him, that's Judas, and all the rest fled. Jesus was alone. When they saw the misery of Christ, they all fled. Likewise, Paul says about his experience in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. All men forsook me. Paul was alone. In fact, Paul actually tells Timothy, don't be ashamed of me, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul, Timothy seemed to have been affected by all the sufferings Paul was undergoing. It was hard to watch a beaten man, a wounded man, struggling to stand upon his feet to preach, again to be thrashed by people, arrested, dragged away. Timothy was a little bit affected, so Paul reminded him, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of courage and of a sound mind and of love. So, church and good men can be affected by all the troubles that the world put upon God's servants. It can be very dangerous. Hope we will be like Jonathan. You know, who should we stand with? I hope we will not be told that we have abandoned. I know how important it was to stand with Reverend Timothy Toe in his last audio, his last audio. I was not there when he went through the big battles with the Presbyterian Church and the WCC, and which led to the beginning of Bible Presbyterian movement. I was probably one or two years old when he was doing that. And then many struggles. But in his last stage of life, he loved the King James Bible because of the text underlying it. And I understood it. And I felt it's my duty to stand with him. I had my fair share of trouble for standing with him for the word of God. And for God, I was not standing with Raman Thor because I thought he would give me a lot of money. Anyway, he didn't give any money, but he loved me a lot. He introduced me to get so many. He prayed for me. That's good enough. I didn't go with him for any financial gain, but because of his loyalty to God. And I knew he was chosen by God. I could see it. God has done so many wonderful things. And I knew where I should be. As a student of Robinso and as a collaborator in FEBC. And I thought that was the best thing I have decided to do. 
in my relationship with Robin Thil. To be with him in this battle for the Bible. You all better know in your time who are your friends. It's not a small matter, you know. Let me warn you about the danger of having people who are just full of anger and bitterness and speak with such scorn and contempt and every opportunity to hit people they will hit with words and actions and attitude. Be very careful of that person. If you are such a person, go on your knees and repent because you can be in great danger of your own anger. Let's go to book of Proverbs for a short while and take you to some very powerful warnings against being angry and full of wrath. Proverbs 27, verse 4. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 27, verse 4. What does it say? Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. But who is able to stand before envy? All of these three are found in who? King Saul. <laughs> wrath, anger, and envy. This is a rhetorical question. There's no question, uh, I mean, there's no doubt about the answer of this question. Wrath is cruel. Yeah, it is. Anger is outrageous. Look at the way King Saul behaved when Jonathan asked for justice and mercy. He was so outrageous. He grabbed the javelin and threw at his own son. Look at the words he has spoken to his own son. All false accusations. Ah, oh, mindless man. Who is able to stand before envy? Not even Jonathan can stand. David fled. Jonathan also. Your own children cannot stand you. Your own parents cannot stand you. Your own siblings, your own spouse cannot stand you. You create a mess out of your uncontrolled bitterness. You know, you may cover it up. It will not help you. Let me show you a few more verses from the book of Proverbs that will help us to understand the danger of wrath. Turn with me to chapter 15 of Proverbs. Verse 18. Be prepared to flip, a, flip into different directions of the book of Proverbs. Uh, here we are told in chapter 15, verse 18, A wrathful man stirreth up what? Strife. A hot-tempered man stirs up quarrels. He easily picks up a fight. He has no sense of justice, fairness. He just won his way. If anybody seems to be against him, not necessarily against, but if he conceives even falsely that somebody is against, he's prepared to whack that person. Go to chapter 10, verse 12. Same truth is mentioned. Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirreth up strifes. Not just strife. But in plural, strives. Be very careful. Same truth again in chapter 29 of Proverbs, verse 22. An angry man stirreth up strife. Chapter 29, verse 22. Well, why would the book of Proverbs say it so many times? That anger, strife are twin brothers. Is it not to warn us? Let us be very careful. Look at chapter 29 of Proverbs, verse 22. A furious man aboundeth in transgression. The last part of verse 22. 
Proverbs 29, 22. Do you see that? A furious man aboundeth in transgression. And of course, uh, in earlier uh, chapter, uh, chapter 21, it is said about women who are angry, it is better to dwell in a corner of the house stop than with a brawling woman in a white house. But then men should remember, not only women are angry, men are also angry. If you are angry with an angry wife, you are not allowed to be angry. Because if you are angry, as we just read in Proverbs 22, 29, 22, a furious man aboundeth in transgression. Once anger does not give us room to be angry. Jonathan actually was very angry with his father. Remember? There was fierce anger in his heart. He was actually in danger of getting himself into trouble. We, we must be very careful when others provoke us because if we don't control our feelings, we may end up sinning. The words, please, please take note of the words. Proverbs 29, 22. A furious man, what? Not commit one sin, aboundeth in transgression. So that is something we must be very mindful of. Another warning about anger is this. Proverbs 14, 17. Not only aboundeth in transgression, the Bible actually says in Proverbs 14, 17, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. To be mindless. All sense of logic and rationality will go from your mind. You will act foolishly. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. So, what is then the solution to such a situation? Control your anger. Acknowledge the dangers. Teach yourself what the scripture says about anger. If you don't take note of the warnings, the danger signs put up by the scripture, you are a fool. So tell yourself, my anger is no good. My bitterness is no good. My lack of long-suffering is no good. I must not move. I must not let my heart be filled with anger. It must go. It must quickly leave. Yeah, there may be reasons why I'm angry. I, I might have been dealt with angrily. I mean, I might have been de dealt with treacherously. But I should not be anger, angry. God will take care of it. I should overcome evil with good. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. I will not take it upon myself. Proverbs 19.11, please. Proverbs 19.11. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. So not only you warn yourself against anger, you remind yourself about the dangers that the Bible says about anger, you must also be discreet. Discretion of a man. Think carefully. Don't give in to passion. You see, anger often causes us to act rashly, without thinking, without considering whether we are having the right kind of thinking, whether our response would lead to greater danger. Think before you act. Especially when you're angry. Especially when you're disappointed. Don't just get out and do, you know, you can say, oh, I am trying to be sympathetic, or I'm trying to make others understand. I just want to clear the air. But sometimes all these words are used to justify your anger. Words of anger. I just want to clear the air. I just want to show, you know, Others that that person is dangerous, I must protect others, so I really want to warn everyone. That's why I tell everybody about that person. 
to warn them. He is so evil. But how do you know he is really evil? Maybe the person's anger against you is because you have done wrongly. You have done many things wrong, and that's why the person is very angry with you. Not because a person is always evil. There are many things we often say to justify our anger. It's not good. Discretion. Discretion of mind. So don't give yourself to rash actions. Here is another counsel before we end. Proverbs 14, 29. 14, 29. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is a hasty of spirit exalteth holy. Slow to wrath. And the next line, hasty of spirit. Hasty of spirit does not mean you do things with speed, but hasty of spirit means rash attitude out of an angry spirit. So if you are slow to wrath, you will show great understanding. Your words, your actions, your management of your relationships, your areas of responsibility shows that you are a person of understanding. In fact, if that situation is in the hand of somebody else who is without understanding, he would have thrashed the place and destroyed the relationships and the responsibilities. But if you are a man of understanding, you will be slow in getting anger. The words may be very, very piercing. The person's attitude can be really disgusting. But you are slow to wrath, deliberately, because you know hasty of Spirit means exaltation of folly in yourself. Calmness. Pray, go and pray. No need to react always. Maybe it would be good for you to read Proverbs 16.32 as well. And then we pray in closing. Proverbs 16.32. He that's slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth is spirit than he that taketh a city. You may be a mighty conqueror. You may be a great warrior. You may even beat Goliath the giant. But if you don't have control over your own spirit, you are a disaster. May God help us to have a heart that is slow to anger, that we may be strong before God and his people. Let's all arise. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father for your great mercies toward us. So often we have acted foolishly, we have spoken rashly. So many times our reactions reflected our foolish nature. Make us a people who are calm and well controlled. When we are so sad and agitated, teach us to pray, remembering that God loves us and he will never abandon us. Even if we have innumerable enemies trying to destroy us with their words and actions, the Lord is our defender. Help us never to act in unjustif unjustified anger, unrighteous anger. May we remain calm and quiet, ready to suffer, and leave the matters of vengeance to the Lord, and wait. Help us all, O oh Lord. Please forgive all our sins. Please help us to go back to our places of living and work and study and activities to maintain a wise heart. We pray this that you may be magnified in us and that we may be instruments of your righteousness and your will on this earth. 
Thank you for this day. Thank you for the wisdom you have given to us. We give you thanks and praise. May you send us with thy peace. May the peace that passeth all understanding guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Amen. The Lord be with you all. Good night.